Well, hello and welcome to Cultivate Church Online. So glad that you're a part of today's online experience, especially if you're tuned in for the very first time. We want to welcome you as our guest. Well, today we're in week two of our Summer Sunday series in person at both of our campuses all month. We have different guest speakers and different voices that you're hearing from our platform. And online, we're having a special uh, series together as well. We're taking a look back at some of our favorite messages from times past, and I'm really excited about the message that you're going to see today. But before we dive in, take just a few seconds, check out some things that we want you to be a part of this summer here at Cultivate Church. Hey Cultivate Church, we are so glad you're here. Now for what's going on and what's coming up, here's the latest. Check in or leave us a review on Facebook. This month, every 10 will help to provide bricks to build a school for kids in need. Fill out your digital connect card. We would love to know you were here with us today. Make a difference and join the C team. There is no greater joy than serving with others at Cultivate. Roots is the place to start. Visit the address below to get started today. Baptism is a life-changing experience and a reason to celebrate. We would love to celebrate with you. If you would like to be baptized, let us know on your Connect card. Tonight is our first men's gathering hosted at our Alabaster campus. The fun kicks off at 5.30 p.m. There will be food, worship, a guest speaker, and a ton of fun. It's finally here. Kids Fest is July 18th through 20th hosted at our Alabaster campus. If you would like to serve, let us know on your Connect card. Hey students, join us for Lake Day on Saturday, July 16th. Text the number below and follow us on Instagram to stay in the know. That's all the news for today. If you have any questions, let us know on your Connect card. Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to Church Online. We're in our Summer Sunday series. We've talked about a lot of topics all summer long. And today, I wanna to talk to you about a tested faith. A tested faith. I'm out here on Lay Lake in Shelby County near our Columbiana campus. And my hope today is to kinda of take us all on a faith journey. Now we've all had our faith tested at some point in our lives. I remember the first time really as a child when my faith was really tested in something my brother, we were at a theme park, and my older brother forced me on a roller coaster. And uh, I hated it. He thought, I'm going to get him on it. He's going to love it. My faith was tested, my faith in him. I remember the day after I was married to my incredible wife, she convinced me to get on another roller coaster. Told me all kinds of lies, that it didn't go in circles, or it didn't have loops. Well, all it had was loops. My faith was tested that day. I thought, we're not even going to make it. First day in, she's telling me lies. Faith was tested in her. My faith has been tested. I've seen families, sat with families whose kids were dying of disease and struggled to find answers to what and how and why things were happening. I've seen so many of my friends struggling with life. I've watched people that I love through the years struggle and we've asked the same questions that maybe you have asked in your own life. Why them? Why me? Why now? Why do good things, why do bad things happen to good people? Why does it have to happen in, to me now? You know, I've learned over the last 22 years of my faith journey with Jesus, following Jesus, submitting to His will for my life, is that God's not afraid of our questions. You see, I love what James said about a tested faith. He said this in James chapter 1. He said, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect 
and complete, needing nothing. Hebrews chapter 11 really tells us what faith is. It really tells us that faith is demonstration. If you've ever been tested, if you ever had a test, what does a test do? Well, it asks us to demonstrate our knowledge or our ability to do something. And Hebrews 11.1 1 says that faith is the reality of what we hope for. It's the substance of things hoped for. What does that mean? It means that it's, the, it's faith demonstrated. We hope in something and we believe with everything in us that even when we don't see it, it's coming to pass. That's what faith really is. So I want to walk you through Hebrews chapter 11 today. And I just want to talk about some of the demonstrations of what faith really is and our walk with Jesus, all right? So number one, the very first thing I'll share with you is that faith worships. I'm gonna demonstrate my faith. It means I'm gonna worship. It says this in Hebrews chapter 11, verse four. It says, it was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man and God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. Abel demonstrated his faith through worship. He brought a gift. I remember years ago, we began to come out here on this lake, Brandon Matthews and I did, and the first time we ever brought a boat out here onto Lay Lake, we got stuck. We were just cruising along and we didn't really know our way around the lake. And if you know much about this lake, that's not a very good thing to do by yourself, not knowing where you're going and what you're doing. And the next thing we knew, we were hitting stumps everywhere and we were just cruising down the lake. We turned it off and we looked down and there was this minefield of stumps all around us. We almost sunk the boat the first day we ever took it out in the lake. Why? Because we didn't know where we were going and what we were doing. We just thought we're going to have a good time. We're going to go out on the lake. And we didn't realize we were in a stump field. We were in a mine field. Can I tell you that many people are just wandering through life? Or maybe you're like we were that day. You're full throttle on the lake with zero idea of how to get to where you're going. You see, Abel knew the answer. The Bible talks about it. His brother brought a gift, but it was kind of a half-hearted gift. He really wasn't interested in, in fully knowing or understanding or demonstrating his faith to God. And the Bible says when Abel brought his gift, it was full-hearted. He brought him his best and his first. It was, it was wholehearted worship to the Father. And the Bible says that God approved it. You see, when I give God my first and my best, that's what really what worship is. And the Bible says he'll come to us. The Bible says it in Jeremiah 29, 13, that if I seek him with my whole heart, I'll find him. Because faith worships. I would encourage us all, let's stop giving him our leftover time, our talent, and our treasure. And we'll find that we'll find ourselves out of those stump fields in more clear direction, knowing which way to go and what to do. Because faith demonstrated is consistently giving God our best in worship. The next thing I'll share with you is, is that faith walks. It just walks the walk. It doesn't talk a lot, but it demonstrates it by, the, by walking it out. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5 and 6 says it this way. It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, listen, he was known as a person who pleased God. He walked with God. It's impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to know Him, wants to come to Him, must believe that God exists and that He rewards those who sincerely seek Him. See, faith demonstrated walks the walk. In 2017, we began the process of planting our Columbiana campus. And we had prayed and we just felt and we knew that this was a word from God, that this was what we were supposed to do in the season of our church. And we began negotiating on a facility in early 2017. And months and months of work and negotiating when took place that year. All to get to the end of the year, later in the year, for the whole deal to completely fall on its face. We didn't know what to do. We had already announced we're, we're planting this campus and we had nowhere to go and nowhere of even, we had no place to even think about what was next. And when you know it, a lady in our church, Betsy King, many of you know her, she serves in our Columbiana campus. She had a dream and she called us the next day 
And this was literally days after the deal falling on its face that we thought was supposed to be the facility for our church. And she said, guys, I, don't, I just want you to know I had a dream last night, and, and I think it's about what's supposed to be our new campus. Well, the problem was that facility wasn't on the market. So Betsy calls the owners of the facility, asked them. She said, I don't even know if this is something you want to do, but our church is looking for a facility and wanted to know if this was available. And she said, you're not going to believe this, but I've got a for sale sign in my hand and I'm about to put it out in the yard. See, Betsy walked. She walked with God. She had a deep, loving relationship with the Father. And as a result, he gave her direction. She demonstrated her faith walking with God and he developed it out by giving direction and steps that we would take even as a church. What am I saying? I'm saying that when you walk with God, he always leads the way. So there's some questions. How am I walking with God? What does that look like for me personally? You want to write this down. Ask yourself this question. Am I reading my Bible? Am I picking up the word on a consistent basis and asking God to speak to me through his word? Am I spending intentional time in prayer? Come on, I'm not talking about just praying at bedtime or, or saying a blessing over the meal when you sit down to eat, but I'm talking about specific, consistent, intentional time with the Father where you set time aside and you turn off the devices and you, you get away from the norm and you just say, Father, I want to spend some time with you. Does God get my attention? Am I intentional with seeking his presence. The Bible says that God in your presence is fullness of joy. See, I know that faith walks. You're walking it out. It's not just something that you claim. It's not just something that's on the tail end of your life, but it's the center of your life. Your faith journey should revolve around relationship, walking it out with the Father. Number three, if you're taking notes, I want to remind you that faith works. It works. Hebrews chapter 11 Verse 7, he continues on in, this, in, in, in the heroes of the faith. And it says, It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about the things that had never happened before. Think about that. Noah begins building a boat because he knows a storm is coming when it had never rained and it had never flooded. And I tell you that people probably and had to think that he was a lunatic. But he believed God and he demonstrated it by going to work. He had never seen what God had promised before, but he knew that God had spoken it, so he was going to put his faith into action. Now, I'm not proud of this, but years ago when we began coming to this lake, we began fishing. And Brandon and I, Brandon Matthews, we, we, we fished for over two years in this lake and we didn't catch one fish. Now, I've fished my whole life. I've caught fish. I don't know why, but we couldn't catch a single fish on this lake. And one, one day, one afternoon, after all day fishing, catching nothing, we were kind of discouraged. We get back to the marina, and there's an older gentleman. When I say older, he had to be in his late 80s. I mean, he was an older gentleman, and he'd come in on his own boat, and um, he pulls in, and we struck up a conversation, and we said, man, we, we couldn't catch a fish. As a matter of fact, we've been out here for a couple of years and we haven't caught a fish on this lake. And in the moment, we kind of thought we were going to get a little bit of empathy from the guy. Yeah, you know, it's kind of difficult out here. You got to really know what you're doing, but that's not what we got. He began to unload his live well. He had about 35 fish in his live well. He said, well, son, it's not because they're not biting. <laughs> it's not because they're not biting. In other words, you're not catching fish, not because the, the harvest isn't there, not because it's not available to do. You're probably not putting in the work that's needed to accomplish the goal. Maybe you can relate to this story. Maybe somewhere in your own life you felt as if you've worked hard. You've worked and worked and worked and man you haven't caught anything. I can imagine Noah working and working, trusting God but seeing nothing happen. It never rained before. Come on, don't you know how dumb Noah had to have looked all of those years building this boat. They don't even know what a boat is. He's building it. He's doing what the Lord told him to do. Even though he couldn't see any fruit of his labor, he continued to do it. And he looked so dumb until it started to rain. He looked so stupid until the flood started rising. And then all of the sudden, the knowledge of God, putting faith, putting action to his faith, began to work out in his favor. 
I'm reminded of a story in Luke chapter 5 of the disciples fishing all night long, had caught nothing. And the, ne- and the next morning, after fishing all night long, you're going to know they had to be exhausted. They were sweaty. Bugs had been biting. And they were ready to go home, and Jesus comes out. And don't you know, Jesus had to have caused a little bit of tension in the conversation. He said, why don't you just throw your nets on the other side of the lake? I can imagine Peter thinking, Jesus, we fished this entire lake all night long. What do you mean just throw it on the other side of the lake? But Jesus had a little bit of influence. Peter said this in Luke chapter 5, verse 5. He said, Lord, we fished all night long, but if you say so, we'll give it one more shot. The Bible says that they threw the nets over on the other side of the boat. Come on, they weren't even in a different area, simply just threw the nets, walked in obedience, put their faith into action. They didn't trust that the lake would produce fish. They trusted that Jesus would do something out of what he had told them to do. They began to catch so many fish that they called others over to help them because they were sinking the boat. They just tried one more time. Maybe today you can one more time commit to put your faith into action. Come on, maybe today one more time you're going to work on your marriage. One more time you're going to work on your relationship with your kids. Just one more time you're going to try to share your faith with that friend who's denied faith for so long and pushed you away for so many times. Or maybe today, today's going to be the day one more time I'm going to work on not visiting that website that I just can't seem to get away from. One more time, I'm not going to pick up that drug or that addiction or that thing that's holding me back. I'm going to give it one more shot. Why? Because faith works. Today, we're going to put our faith into action. And even though I can't see an end result, I'm trusting that the Word of God in me and through me is enough to bring me out on the other side. Faith works. If you're taking notes, I know that faith also waits. Waits. Hebrews 11, I love this. It was by faith that Sarah was able to have a child. Though she was barren and was too old, she believed that God would keep his promise. And so a whole nation came from this one man who was as good as dead. A nation who, with with so many people, that like the stars in the sky and the the sand on the seashore, there was no way to count it. Can I tell you today that God is in the waiting? Come on, if you're doing your your part and you're putting your faith into action and you don't seem to be catching anything and you don't seem to be seeing fruit, maybe you can just stay in that mode and continue to put your faith into action and wait on God. Hebrews 11 really only talks about the victory of faith with Abraham and Sarah. But Genesis records what happens before that moment. The Lord says in Genesis chapter 16, verse 3, that, he had, that, that he, was, he had prevented them from having kids. It was so long, He had promised them that they were going to have a child. But Sarah said, He's prevented me from having a child. It's taking too long. So I'm going to take things into my own hands. The Bible says that she went to Abraham and told him, We've got a servant. You should sleep with her and have a child, and I will claim that child as my own. Maybe that's how the Lord is going to work. And the Bible says that Abraham took her at her word, and they did, and they had a son and named him Ishmael. But the problem was that wasn't the promise that God had given them. And he told them to wait, wait, wait on him. How many times have we gotten ahead of ourselves trying to force a scenario, trying to force a circumstance, when all the while we knew we should have waited Isaiah 40, 31 says that those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. Can I tell you that I know in seasons, especially the season that we've been in this year in 2020, that waiting is exhausting. It can be exhausting to wait. But can I tell you, when you're waiting on the Lord, He will consistently renew your strength. God is in the waiting. Don't turn your life into an Ishmael when you know you should be waiting on an Isaac. When God's promise is real in your life, let's wait on God's best. Stop taking the good and throwing away the God because God's got something better. You put your faith into action and God is in the waiting. If you're taking notes, we'll continue. Faith wars. Faith wars. It fights. Hebrews chapter 11, 24 through 26. It says, it says, it was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead 
of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own treasures, all the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking ahead to his great reward. You see, Moses was willing to negotiate. He was willing to war with what was going on inside of him. He wasn't willing to accept the good and throw away the God. He chose the God over the good. He chose to identify with God's suffering people. Here's what I know. That true faith causes a believer to hold tight to right values and to make right decisions. Maybe you're dealing with decisions that need to be made in your own life right now. And it's a faith decision and you've been working hard and and man, you've been trying to wait on God, but you're faced with this decision and you're just ready to get things going. You're ready to move forward and maybe you're struggling with uh, the decision that might be ethical or unethical. Or maybe if I do this, it's not that bad. It's just a little twisted. It's just a little off. Maybe God will, he'll forgive me for that. But I can tell you that faith, it's willing to war with that part of our life. Faith is committed, a warring faith is committed to honoring God and allowing Him to be Lord over my life. Can I remind you of something in this pandemic season? It's Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of an unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Maybe you're faced with a decision that's causing you to want to do something unethical or not. Maybe, maybe you're warring with somebody. Maybe something, someone has said something on social media or said something directly to you and you have just been walking in a fence. You have this strong desire just to take things into your own hand. Can I tell you today that we don't war against flesh and blood. Stop fighting against flesh and blood and blood, and let's turn our attention to the battle that really matters. It's the war against our true enemy, against evil rulers and authorities of an unseen world. Choose the God over the good. Take the high road. Come on, pray for one another. Show some grace in this season. Love one another in spite of our differences. Come on, I'd be... I wonder if there's anybody tuning in today that's willing to to war in in the spiritual realm. They're willing to to go to battle spiritually for one another. Knowing that someone's struggling on the other end of that screen. Someone's struggling on the other end of that phone call. Someone's really battling in their own life spiritually and emotionally and psychologically. And maybe, just maybe, as a follower of Jesus, I'm willing to go to battle for them. I'm going to begin again to pray for them, call out to God for them, bless them, God, serve, figure out ways to serve them. I'm going to go to war with the enemy, not with flesh and blood. I'm willing to do what I know is right, even if no one else around me is doing it. Why? Because faith wars. Faith fights the good fight. Moses chose the God over the good. He chose the desert over the palace. Why? Because he knew that there was a greater reward waiting. Come on, let's let's go to battle together as a faith family. Let's choose to fight against principalities. Come on, we're fighting against an evil uh, uh, enemy. And let's take that to heart and know that God is going to walk with us and we're going to come out on the other end victorious. And the last thing I'll share with you is faith wins. Always. Faith always wins. It's never lost. Hebrews 11, 29 and 31. It says, It was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground. Come on, they thought they were, they thought they were goners. Backed up against the Red Sea. Why did you bring us here? And then God opens the Red Sea. Faith always wins. But when the Egyptians tried to follow, they were all drowned. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls came crashing down. Jericho, come on, Israel had never been, had not even really been in a battle yet. And the Lord caused the whole entire city to crumble before their eyes. Faith always wins. It was by faith that Rahab, the prostitute, was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God. So for years, I blamed my brother for my fear of heights and roller coasters and all the other stuff, any kind of challenge or any kind of 
crazy thing that people would do. My fear of it, I kind of blamed on him because he put me on a roller coaster before I was ready when I was six. And for all of those years, anytime there was some kind of challenge or something like that that would bring fear well up inside, I would just not do it. I would quit. So little bit by little bit, I slowly began to realize that I had let a moment dictate my entire life when it came to taking risk. So little by little, I began to gain small victories over my fears. You see, I've learned that yesterday's victory gives me courage for today's challenges, for today's fight. The fact that I'm standing here today is a testimony that God's brought me through all of my yesterdays. All of the challenges, all of the ups and downs, God's been with me every time. I've learned in my faith journey that it always wins. Faith always wins. The same God that brought Israel through the Red Sea, the same God that conquered Jericho, the same God that, that brought victory to Rahab and protected her and her family is the same God that'll protect you and I. As a matter of fact, even today, I've been challenged bringing this message to overcome one of my biggest fears. So check this out. Are you worried about it? Um, yeah, I mean, just a little. A little nervous. Oh my God. Bro, I don't know. I don't know if I can do it, man. I'm scared to death. Come on, now that might not have been a big deal for some of you guys watching, but that's a big deal for me. Never have I ever done anything like that. It's what I want you to know today. Faith always wins. Maybe you're here today and you've just been beat up by the enemy. Maybe the enemy has battered your faith through circumstances, come on, through this pandemic season, through the social injustice going on, through relationships lost because of opinions. Maybe it's your faith's been battled because of some unknown sickness or because of some disease that attacks your body, or maybe it's been cancer or, or whatever, a bad doctor's report. Maybe something in your life has begun to batter your faith. And like so many people in the world, you've been asking God, why now, why here? Why this? Why me? What have I done? I want you to know today that there's a God in heaven that loves you more than you could ever dream or imagine. And maybe your faith just needs a little bit of God. Maybe you just need to begin a real authentic relationship with Him. I want you to know today that no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you've done in your past or whatever's going to happen in your future, the Lord knows you more and better than any other person, than any other thing on this earth. He loves you more than you could ever dream or imagine. And today, right where you are, I just want to introduce you into a relationship with Him. The Bible says that this is how much He loved you, that He sent His only Son to die on a cross. He lived 30 some odd years on this earth, sinless. He never made a mistake. He never sinned. And the Bible says that He went to the cross bearing our sins, all of our mistakes. And he died sacrificing himself on that cross. The Bible says, though, that three days later, he came back to life. Why? Because faith wins. It always wins. The Bible says that he conquered death, hell, and the grave. And because he did that, today we've got an opportunity to begin relationship with him that's going to lead to an eternity with the Father. The Bible says it this way, that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. That's you. That's me. We've all got sin in our life. We're all messed up. We've all fallen. But the good news is that whosoever will can come and receive salvation through Jesus. It says it in Romans chapter 9 that if we'll confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts that Christ died and rose again, then we will be saved. 
Come on, what if today you began a brand new relationship with Jesus? Just like scripture promises can happen. Right where you are, maybe you can pray with me. Father, forgive me of my sins. I confess today that there's nothing good in me apart from you. And from this point forward, I'm going to follow you as my Savior, and I'm going to submit to you as my Lord. You have complete control. I give myself to you. My life belongs to you. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. From today forward, I'm going to live a life on purpose in a way that honors you so that you can get all of the honor and all the glory out of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Once again, thank you so much for being a part of Cultivate Church Online today. If you said yes to Jesus, will you let us know by clicking the link right there at Church Online? Send us an email or even a DM through social media. We want to be able to pray for you, and we would love to send you next steps that just tell you how to begin walking out your relationship with Jesus. Hey, before we go, we're going to take a few seconds for a moment of giving. If you're our guest today, this is not for you. But for those of us who call Cultivate Church home, this is just an extension of our worship and what we do in honoring Jesus together. Right there on the screen are some very easy ways that you can give right here at Cultivate Church. The principle always is we can do more together than we can ever do on our own. All summer, so many incredible things have been happening around here at Cultivate Church. We've been reaching out, serving our communities. We have Kids Fest. We've had our men night we've had things for our students there's so many things that we do and none of that is about just the inside of the building every single bit of that is what we do to give away out and reach our community so we want you to know that every time we partner together in this moment it helps make a difference all around us so thank you for being a generous church well I love you I'm so glad again that you were part of cultivate church today we would love to see you in person at one of our campuses for summer Sundays but if not We'll see you right here at Church Online.